All right. Hello, everyone. This is the video for the joints of the upper limb. This is the last chapter um, in the first exam course material. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Once again, this is the SCRUBS team, which stands for the Student Collaborative Resources for Understanding and Brady Success. So a mission statement for SCRUBS. Uh, SCRUBS is a student-driven a driven initiative that aims to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohorts that will pass through Brody. And we participate in a variety of different subcommittees looking to create resources for students by students. These resources are offering a unique perspective from students who have gone through the course and are developing resources that we wish we had been exposed to while we were in the course ourselves. The hope is that this will become a staple of the Brody student body and will continue to you know, expand into the different courses that Brody offers to exemplify the unique collaborative community at the Brody School of Medicine. And with that, let's go ahead and look at our disclaimer. So as always, we do have a disclaimer that we put into our resources. And this is to remind you that despite going through multiple stages of vetting, we are indeed students and there is the possibility that there are mistakes with any of our resources, although we limit this to the best of our ability. In addition, this is a supplemental resource, meaning that this in no way replaces the instruction of the Brody faculty or the resources provided to you by the faculty members. So use this as a supplement, um, but not as your primary source for course material. With that, let's go ahead and get into a little bit of content. So first, the next two slides are going to cover um, some review of the osteology of the upper arm. Um, the first is looking at bones of the shoulder girdle. So we're going to start off by looking at the scapula. So um, as you can see, this first image is of the dorsal view of the scapula, which is probably how you're most familiar viewing it. Um, as we can see, we have the scapular spine, we have the infraspinous fossa and the supraspinous fossa. The points that I want to point out here is specifically related to the uh, joints of the shoulders. So we're going to look at the coracoid process, which is going to be anteriorly located. So here it is on the anterior view. And the acromion. The acromion is the continuation of the scapular spine as it comes more laterally. We can see that it's going to actually move a little bit anteriorly throughout its course. Then I want to point out the glenoid fossa, which is going to be important when we talk about the glenohumeral joint. Other things that I want to point out is that do be aware that you may be tested in a lateral view of these structures. So be aware that the coracoid process is located anteriorly and the acromion, once again, is located posteriorly. Here you can see the spine of the scapula. That means that your supraspinatus muscle will be seated up here, whereas your infraspinatus muscle will be seated in this region. And then lastly, your subscapularis muscle will be seated on the inferior or anterior surface of the scapula. All right, so right in this region here. Next, we're gonna look at another bone of the shoulder uh, joint that you need to be able to recognize and identify. So here, um, we're looking at the clavicle and I want to point out that this is an anterior view and this is the sternal end and this is the lateral end. So if you think about that, which, scap uh, which clavicle is this, your right or your left? And if you think about that for a moment, remember you're viewing this from the anterior, so this is medial, this is lateral, this will be the right scapula. Okay, just a fun little tidbit there. Um, so we've got the sternal end and the acromial end. Remember the acromion, we saw that on um, the last slide, the acromion is part of your scapula, that is going to be located laterally near the shoulder. All right. Now, if we look at the uh, inferior view of the scapula, you can see a couple of structures that are going to be important to know, um, to give you an understanding of the reason why ligaments are named the way they are in just a moment. So I want to point out that this is the impression of the costoclavicular ligament. Okay, so that's going to be located on the medial surface or sternal end of the clavicle. And then as we come more laterally, we have the articular surface with the acromion. And then we have these two in, um, impressions. We have the trapezoid line and we have the conoid tubercle. Okay, the conoid tubercle can also be seen if you're looking from a, a superior view of the clavicle. Okay, these are going to be important coming up in just a moment because we're going to look at some ligaments that are named off of these attachment points. All right, and just like that, we are now looking at the actual joints, the testable material for this, um, um, this course back chapter. So we want to start off with joints of the shoulder. There are going to be two that we're going to talk about. The first is the acromioclavicular joint. So over here on the left, you can see some of the important testable information you need to know. The acromioclavicular joint is a synovial joint, and it is a, particularly a plane joint, so that means it allows sliding back and forth. Um, important ligaments that make up the uh, the acromioclavicular joint or support this joint is going to be the acromioclavicular ligament and the coracoclavicular ligament. 
Let's start with the acromioclavicular ligament. That's going to be located right here in red. You can see that located here. So that's going to um, join the acromion and the clavicle. Okay, so the function of this ligament is going to be resist separation of the scapula located here and the clavicle. Okay, so that's your acromioclavicular ligament. And I want to point out that you will need be, to be able to identify each one of these ligaments on the models in the lab as well. So that's why I'm pointing out the identification as well. Um, next, we have the coracoclavicular ligament. So here's your coracoid process. Here's your clavicle. So it makes sense the ligaments holding that together make up the coracoclavicular ligament. Now, I want to point out that there are two ligaments that make up the coracoclavicular ligament. There is the trapezoid ligament and the conoid ligament. If you remember back to the previous slide, there are impressions on the clavicle that correspond with the insertion of both of these ligaments. So how do I remember these two? Well, the trapezoid ligament is located anterior laterally and the conoid ligament is located posterior medially. So one way that I remember this is that C comes before T, so the conoid is medial to the trapezoid. So conoid, trapezoid ligament. These are two that are often confused in the lab and you will be asked to identify. And I want to point out the function of these two ligaments. Uh, they're going to resist the upper movement of the clavicle from the coracoid, such as if I pulled the clavicle here straight up. It, obviously, it will resist that movement, given that it's keeping the um, coracoid process and the clavicle together. And it's going to provide a lot of the weight-bearing support of the upper limb, as well as supporting the acromioclavicular joint. Now to a joint that we use all the time um, in day-to-day -day life, this is going to be your glenohumeral joint. Um, so components of the glenohumeral joint are going to be the glenoid labrum, which we'll see on the next slide, uh, the glenohumeral ligaments, the coracohumeral ligaments, and um, the coracoacromial ligament. So the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket joint, which allows free motion in a lot of different planes. Right? We can do all kinds of things with our arm. We have one other ball and socket joint that you need to be aware of. And that is going to be um, in our pelvis when we're articulating with our uh, femur. So you'll, you'll learn a li little bit more about that as you get later in the course. Uh, but those are our two main ball and socket joints. Now, I want to point out that uh, the specific ligaments that you need to be able to identify. The first is the coracoacromial ligament. So if you look at the name coracoacromial, you can imagine this is going to attach the coracoid process and the acromion. So two different components of the scapula. And you can see that attachment right there. That is going to support the, uh, the joint capsule superiorly. Okay, next we're going to have the coracohumeral ligament. And again, let's look at the names. Coracohumeral, coracoid process, and the humerus. So it's going to be located right here. And once again, that is going to support superiorly and it prevents superior displacement of the humerus. So it keeps the humerus from going up here. And lastly, you're going to have the glenohumeral ligaments, and there's a couple of different components to this. You just need to know that um, there's a group of ligaments here that jointly are named the glenohumeral ligaments, located on the anterior surface right here. Okay, so now uh, I do wanted to show you a cross section. Um, you could be asked to identify structures in this view, either via an image or maybe um, with a radiographic image. So I want to point out that this is the anterior surface and this is the posterior surface. Um, if we look superior, this is going to be our acromion. And right here we can see part of that scapular spine. If this is posterior and this is our acromion, then this structure over here has to be our coracoid process. Okay, so we know that Above the scapular spine, we are going to find our supraspinatus muscle. Okay, below the scapular spine, we'll find our infraspinatus muscle. Also, another rotator cuff muscle, the teres minor muscle, coming up from below. And then lastly, we have our subscapularis muscle, which is on the uh, anterior surface of the scapula. So remember, these are our four um, rotator cuff muscles. Look back at that video if you need a refresher. But what I want to point out is the majority of the support for the shoulder joint is actually coming from these rotator cuff muscles. So when we talk a little bit later about dislocations, the reason that the dislocation is going to occur in the direction that it does is because there is less support in a certain region of the joint um, due to the lack of muscles, muscular support in that region. 
So we'll revisit that at the end of this video. All right, before we get into clinical correlations, I want to point out the elbow joint. So the elbow joint is really, it's going to have a couple of ligaments that you're going to need to know. Um, there's multiple joints that make up the overall activity at the elbow. You have your humero ulnar joint, which is going to be between the humerus and the ulna. It allows articulation between the trochlea and the trochlear notch. And then you have your hemoradial joint. That is going to allow articulation between the cap, uh, capitulum and the radial head of the radius. So there are two ligaments that you need to know, um, the radial collateral ligament and the ulnar collateral ligament. Okay, really the only uh, thing that you need to know about these is find the medial and lateral side of the joint when you're looking in the lab. Find which side is medial, that is going to be the ulnar collateral ligament, and the side that is lateral is going to be your radial collateral ligament. So if we look at a medial view, you can see this group of uh, ligaments right here. These are going to make up different components of your ulnar collateral ligament. So you have an anterior, posterior, and transverse portion. But for the class, you just need to know that there is a uh, sorry, an ulnar collateral ligament located on the medial aspect of the elbow. Now, I do want to point out, you can kind of see from this view um, a little bit of the annular ligament of the radius, but we'll see that better on the lateral view. So over here on the lateral view, you can see different components of the radial collateral ligament. So radial on the lateral side. So here goes the components of the radial, lateral, uh, radial collateral ligament located here. And then the last thing I want to point out is the proximal radio ulnar joint. Um, this is going to be um, composed, or the, the, the ligament that you need to know here is the annular ligament, which you can see that I'm highlighting now. Um, it's going to allow rotation of the radial head during pronation and supination. We're going to see that there's an important clinical association with this um, in just a moment. So one more time, the annular ligament, this is going to be located on the lateral side, and it allows rotation um, uh, when you have pronation and supination of the forearm. Okay, so now let's get into some clinical anatomy. The first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, cromioclavicular joint dislocations. And these are going to be graded as uh, three different types of shoulder separation. There's a total of six types, but you just need to concern yourself with types one, two, and three. So type one shoulder separation is going to be the AC ligament is sprained. Okay, so we can see that indicated here. The acromioclavicular ligament is going to be sprained. All right, so that may indicate a partial tear. You may have involvement of the uh, coracloclavicular joint, but at this point, we're really focusing on a partial tear of the acromioclavicular ligament. Okay, so as we go to type two, now we have a ruptured acromioclavicular ligament. Rupture is going to indicate a complete tear. So this now means that our clavicle and our acromion are separated from one another, allowing our clavicle to be displaced superiorly, right, with force. And then it's going to involve us, or it could involve a sprain. Um, of your coracoclavicular ligaments, which remember are the trapezoid ligament located more laterally and a more medially located conoid ligament. Lastly, a type three um, joint tear. Um, this is going to be ruptured of the acromioclavicular ligament and the uh, coracoclavicular ligaments. So this is going to be complete shoulder separation that can fall away from the clavicle. And the reason for that is you can see that there are no longer any ligaments that are supporting the shoulder joint um, in attachment with the clavicle. So this is actually something that you can test for um, in, in the clinic. Um, if this occurs, you can actually put your hand on the clavicle and it's called the piano key sign. You can push down on the clavicle and it will push down like a piano key because it would have been displaced superiorly. Right? And as far as the mechanism of action uh, for or the mechanism for injury, this is often caused by a direct blow to the acromion, again located right here, or um, a fall on an outstretched upper limb. So when you put your arm out in front of you and your shoulder gets displaced posteriorly. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, joint dislocations at the shoulder joint. Uh, this is because the rotator, again, we mentioned that because of the rotator cuff attachment, there is a little bit less support in the anterior and inferior region of your shoulder joint. So dislocation often happens in this direction. So in order for your shoulder, uh, the proximal portion of your humerus to be dislocated anteriorly, that means the distal portion 
is pushed posteriorly. And this often happens when your arm is abducted and laterally extended, um, like a football player getting ready to throw a pass. So that can be a vulnerable position in order to have this anterior um, humoral dislocation. And lastly, we're going to end this video talking about nursemaid elbow. elbow. This is a pretty common injury uh, to younger children. This occurs when they are lifted while their arm is pronated. So remember, pronated is hand down. So you can actually see that here. The child's arm is pronated and they're being lifted um, up by their forearm. And this is leading to subluxation of the radial head from the annular ligament. And subluxation is an incomplete dislocation. So you can see that there's an incomplete dislocation um, seen in this image. Now, uh, the, the big point, the correlation you make here is nursemaid elbow, annular ligament. In terms of reducing this subluxation, uh, the clinical way to do this is to apply pressure to the radial head. So you'd be applying pressure to this region. And then there are two different maneuvers that you can do. One is the hyperpronation maneuver where you're going to hyperpronate the forearm while the elbow is extended or if the elbow has been at 90 degrees. And then the second maneuver that you can do is the um, supination flexion maneuver. You supinate the forearm, so you're going to go palm up, and then you immediately flex the elbow. And oftentimes if you're um, applying pressure to the radial head during these maneuvers, you'll hear a pop or you'll feel it um, go back into the annular ligament and all will be well. You go and check in on the kid. Um, 20, 30 minutes later, if there's a lot of swelling and you think that um, you haven't fixed the problem, then you can go and get a follow-up x-ray to look and evaluate further. Okay, with that, that brings us to close to the end of your first exam unit. Good luck to y'all on y'all's exam.